the Robin Hood policeman of Guernsey who stole from the Nazis to feed the needy. From Hani Shaft, the girl with the red hair, to Oskar Schindler, who saved 1,200 Jewish citizens from a horrifying fate in concentration camps, World War II is speckled with stories of individual heroes who made a difference and defied Nazi rule. But not all names pass into history. Many heroes remain forgotten, and 18 of those were Guernsey policemen nicknamed the Robin Hood Group. During the war, the closest the Nazis got to invading the United Kingdom was the occupation of the Channel Islands. In mid-June 1940, the British had decided the islands were of no strategic importance during the war and completely demilitarized them, leaving them wide open for Nazi occupation. On the 28th of June, the Germans launched an attack, bombing the harbors of the two principal islands before invading and taking control of Guernsey on the 30th of June 1940. Jersey surrendered the next day. As the year plodded on, the Germans began to realize the quick victory they had hoped for would not come to fruition. So instead, they prepared for a long war and a potential long stay on the islands, which needed fortifying. Thousands of workers were brought in from overseas and the German officers took to the streets, pulling residents out of their houses whenever they saw fit and claiming the properties as their own. The workers, a mix of European, Algerian, and Indo-Chinese nationalities, were little better than slave labor, working on measly rations that weren't sufficient to sustain full-grown, hard-working men. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, the BBC had come up with a new way to undermine the Germans and boost morale across Europe. Douglas Ritchie, an assistant to a BBC news editor, wrote a document entitled Broadcasting as a New Weapon of War, where he put forward ways broadcasting could be used as propaganda and a way to undermine the Germans through bringing Europeans together in solidarity against them. His most famous plan was the use of the V for Victory signs. Each week, the V for Victory sign was a key part of the broadcast, encouraging listeners to find any way they could to display a V. This could be from graffiti to tapping, clapping, or hand gestures. Any creative way someone could display a V through sight or sound was encouraged, with the goal being to unnerve the Germans with this almost silent united protest. Although the broadcasts were more intended as instructions to mainland Europe, Guernsey residents took up the mantle with glee and pride. Among them were five policemen who eagerly took part in the campaign. They were Charles Friend, Frank Tuck, Kingston George Bailey, Jack Harper, and Archibald Tardif. The latter wrote memoirs of their time in Nazi-occupied Guernsey and their role in subverting their occupation. Bailey wrote of a night in July 1941, where the five of them spent a whole night plastering V signs all over the island in places where they would be most seen by the Germans. These small acts of resistance were immensely courageous, given the dangers of defying German rule, but they did nothing to put food in starving bellies. By winter 1941, the people of Guernsey were starving and more and more resorted to stealing. There were thousands of laborers and citizens without enough food, while the Germans stockpiled supplies. But what was less known was that some of the thieves were the Guernsey police force themselves, selflessly risking their lives to break into German stores and return food to Guernsey citizens. As policemen, they were allowed to be out after the 11 p.m. curfew. It all started with Bailey and Tuck, who soon brought a number of other policemen into the group. As Bailey wrote in his memoir, by February 1942, the covert operation was getting out of hand. Practically the whole police force was now taking part. Under the cloak of darkness, they crept into five German stores, while Guernsey women and men lived off of sweet corn and potato pies. Before their very eyes lay succulent sausages, 50 pounds of meat and lard, 10 pounds of dripping vintage pork, and boxes upon boxes of tins with creamy butter and fresh tomatoes. It did not take long for them to dash back down the quiet streets to their homes, hiding the goods in chimneys or burying them deep in their back gardens. Other nights, they sniffed the telephone wires used by the Nazi command and filled to the brim the petrol tanks of German cars with sand. On March 5, 1942, however, Bailey and Tuck were arrested and questioned at the German police headquarters before the entire force was arrested shortly after. By the afternoon, half had been released, and half, 18 men, remained in prison. Whilst detained, the 18 policemen were interrogated, beaten, and basically tortured by the secret field police, or Geheime Feldpolizei, the Guernsey Island equivalent of the Gestapo, in an attempt to get them to confess. Charles Friend wrote that as well as the beatings, they suffered psychological trauma and blackmail with the Germans threatening, if I did not plead guilty and give them a full admission to these various charges, they would fetch my mother and those nearest and dearest to me and torture them as well. 
It was in these circumstances that I made a full confession. Archibald Tardif's memoirs confirm this, claiming they were shown signed statements by other men and were eventually told they would be shot if they did not sign themselves. The policemen also admitted to stealing from the people of Guernsey, but this was likely a lie to save their own skins, as if they admitted to only stealing from the Germans, they would have received the death penalty. In April 1942, the 18 police officers stood up in both the German military court and the Guernsey Royal Court. Historians have dismissed the hearings as a kangaroo court in the worst dictatorship, with the deputy chief of police at the time, Albert Peter Lamy, writing that they had little choice but to accept the fate of the officers. The men were also convinced to accept their punishment because they were told their convictions would not stand after the war. Of the 18 men, 16 were sentenced from eight months to four and a half years of hard labor and deported to prisons, labor, and concentration camps across Europe, including the original five who participated in the v sign campaigns. They suffered horribly, and one, Herbert Smith, even died from his treatment overseas. Kingston Bailey was sent to one of the worst concentration camps, Dachau, while four were sent to the horrific neu Offingen labor camp. The memoirs of the surviving policemen told of the horrors they faced. Frank Tuck wrote that he had been beaten with a pick handle and flogged with the butt of a rifle, and that Smith had been left to die in a Gestapo prison. They were only liberated when victory came for the Allies in 1945. Upon returning home, the Guernsey policemen suffered long-lasting psychological and physical effects. Charles' friend weighed just seven stone and was completely unable to use his legs by the time the Americans broke through, and he later wrote that even 20 years later, his health was still affected. Tragically, when they returned home, their promised criminal pardons from the Guernsey authorities never materialized. It meant that none of them could claim pensions or return to their previous jobs in the police force, partially due to a skewed perspective on the trials in Guernsey, with the narrative being upheld that the courts had continued to operate without Nazi influence, something that was clearly untrue. Ten years later, in 1955, still suffering injuries, psychological trauma, and with completely unjustified criminal records, eight of the Guernsey police officers appealed their convictions. They were unsuccessful. Though later, some did receive some compensation for their suffering, it was not enough to wipe away the stain of how they were treated. All the policemen died with criminal records that, after another attempt of expunging in 2018, can now never be overturned. Instead, their families live with the unfair label, rather than the true remembrance of their ancestors as heroes who defied Nazi rule. Keith Friend later gave an interview about his father's life and legacy, and it is from here that people choose to remember the Guernsey policemen today. It was Keith who first gave them the Robin Hood moniker, stating, I see what they did as a Robin Hood type act. It's not a crime for personal gain. It was to feed hungry people, and as policemen, they were in a position to do something about it.